Okay, this is August 18th, 2016. Um, it's a few days after celebrating the Great Feast of the Assumption down in my old neighborhood, Little Italy, Murray Hill area. Um, this feast is one of those feasts that are greatly misunderstood by our Protestant brothers and sisters in Christ, and they do object to it um, because they don't understand this whole idea of um, Mary's Assumption or what the purpose of her Assumption is in the first place. Uh, I'd like to go over that a little bit. Um, one of their first objections to Mary's assumption is they'll come out and start saying that, well, why would she assume anyways? I mean, she's a sinner like you and me. She's nothing special. You know, yeah, she's she's the mother of Jesus, but, you know, she's still a human being and she sinned and, and all this um, objections they come up with. But let's let's look at that. In the Bible, in the book of Romans, chapter, chapter 3, verse 23, it speaks about all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is true. But there are exceptions to the word all. For instance, we wouldn't say Jesus sinned and he was fully human, not only God, but he was fully human. Um, so there's an exception there. He was um, born without sin, of course, because he's God. I mean, that's a no-brainer. And you might say, well, you know, that's because he's God. He's not just a, a man. He's also God. Okay, well, Adam and Eve both were created and came into this world free of all sin. They were, quote, unquote, born without sin or created without sin. So they, too, are an exception to the um, phrase, all have sinned. It's true that later on they um, decided to go against God's will and, and uh, disobey him and brought... Um, sin into the world with the that first original sin that they committed against God. Um, another exception to the word all have sinned. I don't think anybody would say that mentally ch uh, challenged children um, are guilty of sin. Um, if they're not capable of making a conscious decision, how can he be guilty of sin? Um, how about children under the age of reasons? They, they're, they're not uh, capable of committing sin. Even though they inherit original sin, but we're talking about uh, the scripture where it says all have sinned. Um, so I'm just showing you that there are uh, examples in the scriptures where there's an exception to this rule, uh, rule that all have sinned. And to build upon that, we need to go back to the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant that the Israelites carried around the desert for 40 years. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? Um, how was it made? Well, if you go back in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Exodus, you can read about how the Ark of the Covenant was made. And basically it says that, it says it was made with the best materials of, of the earth. Acacia wood, laden with gold and silver. You know, it was created by the best craftsmen. This box, this container was perfectly made with the best materials that, that man can, can produce as commanded by God himself to be made. And what did this box, carry. Why was this box so special that they had to make it with the best materials of the world? Well, it carried the Word of God in stone, which is the Ten Commandments that, that Moses received on Mount Sinai. It also contained Aaron's staff, which Aaron is the high priest of God at that time, which uh, Aaron is uh, Moses' brother, and he was the high priest. It also contained um, a piece of manna. That's the food that God fed the Israelites in the desert. If you read in the Bible, it talks about he fed them manna from heaven. And so it carried these three items. Now, the Word of God in stone. We go to Jesus Christ. What does the New Testament speak about Jesus Christ? He is the Word of God made flesh. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Word of God in stone. Jesus is the living God, the, or the living Word of God made flesh. Um, Jesus is the high priest, which precedes the priesthood of Aaron. He, he supersedes it. So, you know, Aaron's priesthood in the Old Testament carried around in the Ark of the Covenant. Now you have Jesus, who is the high priest of God and um, is more superior to that. And, of course, Jesus himself said that he will give us his flesh to eat that he will feed us bread from heaven, that he is the bread from heaven that came down to earth. 
to save us from our sins. So the manna in the Old Testament that was put in this box to symbolize God feeding us with, with, with bread from heaven, now we have Jesus today who is our bread from heaven. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He obviously supersedes the, the, the man in the desert. In the desert. Um, so now that you see that Jesus is the Word of God made flesh, He is the High Priest, and He is the true bread from heaven, and this fulfills the Old Testament manna, Aaron's staff, and um, the, uh, um, the, the, the Ten Commandments, the Word of God on stone. Jesus uh, is superior to these things. So, if in the Old Testament, the symbols, these things, the, uh, we could call them typology, the, the types of Christ of the future, these symbols, these important symbols, obviously, the Ten Commandments is extremely important, but it's God's word on stone. And the manna that God fed the Israelites for 40 years in the desert, and Aaron, the high priest, this, his staff, the symbol of his high priesthood. If those items were put in a box and commanded by God to be put in a box that was created with the best of, uh, of materials that man could come up with, acacia wood and gold and, and silver and, and carvings, all kinds of beautiful stuff. That, and not only that, that this box was so holy because it carried these items that only the priests certain designated priests could even touch this covenant box uh, the ark of the covenant as it's called anyone who dared to try to touch it would die that you know that wasn't authorized to touch it which is a case in the old testament where that happened where i think some of the priests were you know they fell down in battle or something and, and someone went to hold the box up and and they died for touching it um because this thing was that special now let's think about it mary carried Jesus Christ in her womb nine months think about that she carried the Word of God made flesh she carried the high priest of God Jesus Christ and she carried the bread from heaven who is Jesus Christ who feeds us with his own body and blood the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant who is Jesus Christ if the Ark of the Old Covenant was made with the best of materials that man can make to house these things would not Mary, who is the Ark of the New Covenant, that's carrying Jesus in her womb for nine months, not be made as perfect? That's where we come up with the idea that, look, how can God create his mother, the mother of Jesus, to be imperfect, to be with sin, to have Satan have any dominion over her? It doesn't make sense because it, it would be injustice. He made this box for the Old Testament carrying these things you know, that were just, you know, they were nowhere compared to what Jesus Christ is. And Mary, the, the Ark of the New Covenant, carrying Jesus himself, of course she's going to be free from all sin. And now it comes to the question, how is that possible? How can she be possible? To, you know, how, how, how can God do this? Well, the way he does it is that, is that, because he's God, he's outside of time and space. And what Jesus would do on the cross on Good Friday to save mankind from sin, he can make present, this saving grace present in Mary's life at the moment of her conception to keep her free from inheriting original sin of Adam and Eve. So that's how that's done. Now, i like to go through some other scriptures uh, to address some of these things give some examples well number one Protestants have this belief in the rapture which Catholics the reason we don't believe in that is because we believe that there's only one there's only two comings of Christ and he's already come once a second time is gonna be for judgment at the end of the world but let's just say for argument's sake the Protestants do believe in a rapture where men and women are gonna be taken up body and soul off this planet so we can look at it Mary's the first one to be quote-unquote raptured body and soul um, number two Elijah we have an example of Elijah the prophet being taken up body and soul into heaven in the fiery chariot and you can read about that in 2nd Kings verse uh, or chapter 2 verse 11 you could also read about Enoch taking up body and soul into heaven in the book of Hebrews the New Testament Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 we read about um, 
Enoch being taken up into heaven. We also um, read scripture passages where, well, here comes the argument. People say, well, okay, uh, but the saints and Mary, they're in heaven. Even if they're in heaven, how can they hear us? They're dead. They'll make this kind of claim. But where does the Bible say that when you go to heaven that you're dead? Or that when you die that you're, you're dead? We read, okay, I want to look that passage up in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 where it talks about the great cloud of witnesses. And let me, okay, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. It says, actually that's, I'm sorry, I meant verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, let us also, having such a cloud of witnesses over us, put away every embrace of the sin entangling us and run with patience to the fight set before us so again it talks about this great cloud of witnesses um these are the saints in heaven they are the ones that surround us as a great cloud of witnesses um we could also look at for the argument the saints can't hear our prayers or people say well how, you know they're dead and this and that well you look in the book of revelations chapter 5 verse 8 and we read, And when he had opened the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, having each a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now did you catch that? The incense. These are bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So if the saints can't hear our prayers, in, you know, while they're in heaven, and where do these where do these, these, these bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, come from? So we see that the saints, in fact, do pray for us, and their prayers are offered up in heaven as bowls of incense. We also can read um, chapter 8, verse 3 of that same book of Revelations. Let me go there to chapter 8, verse 3. And we read... And another angel came and stood before the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given to him much incense, that he might offer it with, with the prayers of all the saints. Offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. So it shows that those who die in Christ and go before us and who are in Jesus Christ, who are in heaven, that's what the saints are, basically, those who die in, in, in Christ and who are, who are saved and are in heaven, their prayers are offered. And their prayers are the prayers that we ask them to pray on our behalf to Jesus Christ, our one um, mediator between God and man. We also look at um, an example from the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark chapter 9, verse 4. And we read there in Mark chapter 9, verse 4, about Jesus' transfiguration. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up the mountain off by themselves and was transfigured before them. And his garments became shining exceedingly white as snow, as no fooler on earth can whiten. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. Now Elijah and Moses have been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years. But yet, they're not unconscious. They're not in some kind of... um coma state or something like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe, you kind of like go into some deep um, soul sleep, some kind of unconscious state. No, they're alive and well, and Jesus proves that by having conversations with Moses and Elijah, and they appeared before, you know, Peter and, and, and a few apostles there at the Mount of Transfiguration. So again, you have Jesus conversing with the quote-unquote dead, and, and the quote-unquote dead are alive and well. So, this idea that when you die or the saints are dead, they can't hear your prayers or unconscious is silliness. It's contrary to, to what the sacred scripture teaches. We also read um, in Mark chapter 12, which is an important follow-up to this passage. In Mark chapter 12, verses 26 through 27, we read, But as to the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses about the about the bush, how God spoke to him, 
saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are therefore entirely wrong. Yeah, you are entirely wrong who say that the saints are dead because those who die in Christ aren't dead. They are more alive than me and you here on earth are because now they're in the presence of God in heaven. And like the Bible says there, God is not a God of the dead, but the living. And there's other passages, um, because some might say, well, maybe those are the angels he's talking about. No, because uh, if you look at Romans chapter eight, go to the book of Romans, and we look up chapter eight in Romans, we're gonna read about how death does not separate us in Christ. Chapter eight, verse 35 says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or hunger or nakedness or danger or the sword? Even as it is written, for thy sake, we were put to death all the day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. And as you read on, it talks about um, St. Paul goes on and says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, or, nor things to come, nor, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. So death does not separate those who die in Christ. So they're in heaven. Those who die in Christ are in heaven. They can pray for us, which they do, as we see in the book of Revelations. Their prayers are offered up as as bowls full of incense offered up. It's it's just amazing. I mean, there's a lot of scripture basis for the idea of the prayer, prayers of the saints. And the whole reason I talked about that was because people try to say, well, you know, Mary's dead, she can't hear us. Uh, there's nothing special. So I'm showing you that these passages do show that she's, she's special. In fact, when you go back to the book of Genesis in the beginning, it talks about the woman whom God is going to put between, enmity between um, her and Satan. That at one point he made a promise after Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the world. He promised the human race that this is not the end of the, the end game. This is not the end of the story. That I will put enmity between you and the woman. The woman in Genesis chapter uh, three verse fifteen is Mary because she's the one who gave birth to Jesus who crushes the head of Satan. Um, also, you look in the book of Revelations chapter 12, it talks about the woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and, and she's crowned with, with the crown of, 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 um, over her head. Uh, it has like uh, 12, let me actually read that. It's a crown of, um, cause I don't want to butcher this scripture passage up. I should have this memorized by now but I get a little rusty sometimes. It says, And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and a moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. That's what I was trying to get to. The 12 stars is a symbol of the 12 apostles. And if you read on, it talks about um, she was cast, or, or that she had to flee from, from the dragon, and, and the dragon went and waged war against all her Look children. I know this is um, a little... Um, mixed up here and there I did this tape in uh, three little sessions I'm gonna have to splice it and try to do a little editing to make it seem a little like it's one piece it makes it nice and flow good you know makes some kind of sense I hope somebody makes some sense out of this and, and this is helpful to, to somebody out there and understanding that but again like I say if you have any more questions the best place to go to get some answers some good solid answers about the Catholic faith is simply going to Catholic Answers website which is www.catholic.com. They have a lot of um, radio archive shows on there that covers just about every topic that I can, that you could probably imagine on, on the Catholic faith. It's a good resource, a good place to learn more about the Catholic faith. They even have um, a staff of apologists that you can call there certain times of the day, talk to them and get um, more in depth answers to your questions. So again, if this video is helpful for you, um, Feel free to share it with others that you, you think it may help. And till next time, God bless you. And may the Blessed Virgin Mary pray for us all. To Jesus, her Son, our one 
and all, a once for all mediator between God and man, our one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who once and for all sacrificed himself for our sins to even make us have any grace whatsoever to be talking about here. God bless you and have a great day. Okay, that's the part I was trying to get to. Um, it says, And the dragon was angered at the woman and went away to wage war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. So we know this woman is Mary because it talks about Jesus in this passage that Satan is waging war. And obviously, um, we are we who are Jesus' brothers and sisters are also Mary's offspring and Satan makes war against us. There's another reason why we call Mary mother. As well as the fact that Elizabeth called her um, uh, full of grace. Um, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Um, how is it that the, the Lord of my mother would come to me? Uh, that's a whole other topic, though. So basically, what it, the Feast of Assumption is, is a precursor of our own assumption. When we die and our bodies are resurrected and our soul united back with our souls and brought it to heaven, and um, Barry's basically the first person to, to be brought into heaven, body and soul. And it's a precursor to our own day when we will be um, uh, brought body and soul into heaven. And even at the end of the road, there's going to be a bunch of people, thousands, tens of thousands of people that will actually be um, assumed into heaven, body and soul. They won't even die because uh, the end of the road will come. Some people will, a lot of people will be alive at that moment. But, um, you know, this is a great feast that we celebrate to recognize Jesus' greatest gift that he can bestow on a human being, his blessed mother, giving her that great privilege and grace of not allowing her to die, to rot in the grave, but to assume her body and soul into heaven, which is most fitting for the Ark of the New Covenant. Remember, the Ark of the Old Covenant was made of the best materials in the world. Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant because she carried Jesus in her womb for nine months. I can't imagine why you would allow that Ark to, to um, be discarded or, or, or to be defiled in any way by the corruption and rotting of, of death. Now, as Catholics, we have a tradition that um, um, we, it's, in the Eastern Church, they call it the Dormition, where they believe that Mary went into a deep sleep, and at that moment, Jesus came and assumed her body and soul into heaven. Assume means he came down, he, he took her body and her soul and brought it to heaven so that she would not see decay in a grave. But um, in the Eastern Rite, um, we could believe that she um, didn't even go into any sleep, that she was well awake and was assumed body and soul. So that's not even a really big deal. It's, it's just a difference of um, understanding how it is. The bottom line is what we do believe is that by a special grace from God, by the foreseen merits of what Jesus Christ would do on the cross, that grace he won for mankind to save us from sins, he gave to Mary at the moment of her conception to preserve her free, to preserve her free from all stain of original sin. Now, some people argue, well, you know, in the Magnificat, in Luke's Gospel, I think it's Luke chapter 2 or something, where, G where Mary says, um, my soul magnifies the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And some people say, well, see, you know, Mary's a sinner. She just admitted it because she said God is her Savior. So how can you say she's without sin and, and all this business? Well, I'll give you two scenarios. You have two people walking through the woods. One person walks through the woods. He's going along the woods. There's this hole dug in the ground. It's got a bunch of mud in there. Someone put some leaves over the hole. So the person's walking, doesn't see the hole. He's steps into the hole, falls down in there, gets all muddied up. God comes along, picks the person out of the hole, cleans them up real nice, and the person says, thank you, God, you're my savior. The mud obviously being a symbol of sin, original sin and personal sin. Now you got the second person walking through the same woods, same situation. 
the moment the person steps over into that hole, God grabs the person, lifts them up over the hole and sets them on the other side. The person never falls in and never gets any mud on them, but that person still says, hey, thank you, God, you're my savior, because he saved this person from even getting the mud on them. And in both cases, they can say it's savior. It doesn't mean that they both had to be dirty and muddied up. And that's the situation with, with Mary. At the moment of her conception, by what Jesus Christ did on the, on the cross, that grace that he wins for all humankind is applied to Mary's um, soul at the moment of her conception to keep her free from, from um, inheriting original sin. She was basically created the same way that Adam and Eve were created, without any sin. The difference is that she always said yes to God throughout the rest of her life, where Adam and Eve did not, and they did their own uh, plan against God. So hopefully this helps you understand a little bit of the, the teaching of the Catholic understanding of the um, Feast of the Assumption. Um, and uh, as you hear some thunder out there, I don't know if that means I did a good job or a bad job, but I'll let you guys be the judge of that. I know this is um, a little um, mixed up here. And there I did this tape in uh, three little sessions. I'm gonna have to splice it and try to do a little editing to make it seem a little like it's one piece. It makes it nice and flow good, you know, makes some kind of sense. I hope somebody makes some sense out of this and, and this is helpful to, to somebody out there in understanding that. But again, like I say, if you have any more questions, the best place to go to get some answers, some good solid answers about the Catholic faith is simply going to Catholic Answers website, which is www.catholic.com. They have a lot of um, radio archive shows on there that covers just about every topic that I can that you could probably imagine on, on the Catholic faith. It's a good resource, a good place to learn more about the Catholic faith. They even have um, a staff of apologists that you can call there certain times of the day, talk to them, and get um, more in-depth answers to your questions. So again, if this video is helpful for you, um, feel free to share it with others that you you think it may help. And till next time. God bless you, and may the Blessed Virgin Mary pray for us all, to Jesus, her Son, our one and all, once for all mediator between God and man, our one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who once and for all sacrificed himself for our sins to even make us have any grace whatsoever to be talking about here. God bless you, and have a great day.